Hey y'all, what's up? Welcome back to ENL 51, Rap as Poetry. We're in week four. Uh, we've got some difficult themes to work through, difficult but essential to understanding what hip hop culture and what rap is all about. Uh, difficult themes to work through this week. Violence, death, and elegy. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into as usual, talking a little bit about those themes, giving some background and context and definitions and stuff. And then I will uh, give an overview and some background information for the, the material that we're studying, the songs and uh, poems and stuff that we're studying this week. Cool. So first of all, uh, probably don't need to define violence and death, but elegy uh, may or may not be a new term for some of you. Um, it is not to be confused with eulogy, though they're similar on, on a number of different levels. I think they have different uh, roots. Um, elegy is a poem, a kind of poem, uh, that is a tribute to or an ode to or a remembrance of uh, a dead person. Um, oftentimes it's a famous or historical figure. Uh, occasionally it can even be not like a person, but a, a concept or an idea. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of an example and failing. Elegy to Los Angeles, claiming that some aspect of LA had died, for example. So poets do all kinds of metaphorical stuff like that. Uh, so an elegy is a way for a poet to think about death and remembrance. Uh, and as a way to uh, remember those we have lost or, or ideas or places that we have lost in a way. Um, it's not a term that comes up in rap songs uh, much at all. And yet I think it's uh, an essential kind of writing that so much rap uh, participates in, the elegy. Um, in, in page poems, sometimes an elegy is written directly to the, the, the dead person, the remembered person, like in, in second person. Sometimes it's written about them in third person. Sometimes it, it doesn't even mention the, the specific person much at all, but brings up experiences or images that are somehow associated for the poet uh, with the, the the one who they are remembering. So elegies can, can work in, uh, on the entire scale from literal and direct to uh, metaphorical, figurative, associative, tangential, and stuff like that. And we'll see that to some extent in the songs we're studying this week. Uh, I wouldn't say that all the songs we're studying this week are elegies necessarily, uh, but some of them certainly are. And uh, I like sometimes I like flipping nouns into adjectives and seeing how that reframes something. So rather than asking, is this song an elegy? Sometimes I might ask, uh, what is, I don't know how to pronounce the adjectival version of elegy, Ele elegiac, elegiacal, elegiac, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, what is elegiac? about this particular song. What, what characteristics of it does it have in common with the elegy? It's one question I might ask uh, if I was doing my own analysis of the songs. Cool, uh, this poet and essayist who I love, uh, Tara Betts, I believe she's from Chicago. Um, she, I saw her gave this wonderful talk at a conference uh, some years ago. And then I found that it's, at least part of it is an essay available online on the, the Poetry Foundation website. Uh, the essay is called Life is Good by Tara Betts. Um, but she said this thing that kind of blew my mind and stuck with me for, for years. She said, hip hop, hip <laughs> she said, hip hop is the home for elegy. Um, Hip hop is the home for elegy, that something about this culture, something about this music, something about this art form creates a, a really in-depth engagement with the themes of elegy, 
death and remembrance and survival. Um, yeah. So that makes me think of this quote by this other uh, brilliant person, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, I didn't stage that transition really well. I made my notes for this lecture very sparse. <laughs> Let me try to transition a little bit more. As I, as I reflect on what is it exactly that makes hip hop the home for elegy, as Tara Betts says, I think about you know a lot of the stuff that we've already been talking about this summer, the black radical tradition uh, and, and rap's response to injustice, uh, issues of gender and sexuality and how those show up as Bell Hooks says in mainstream white patriarchal American culture and how those kind of trickle down or filter into uh, hip hop culture and, and black American culture. Um, the kinds of stuff that we've been that we've been talking about week in and week out, um, the, the social, cultural and political structures and systems that hip hop is, is emerging from and speaking to, uh, I think kind of make it necessary to be a, a space for elegy for these creators and for people who participate in the culture. And one way of thinking about that, that's the transition, uh, is what this scholar Ruth Wilson Gilmore says. She's a geographer, um, which as you get into, I've never taken a, a college or graduate school geography class, but I, I, I've come to understand that as you get into higher education, academia, geography does not just mean like memorizing capitals and stuff uh, as we did in like grade school. Uh, it means uh, something much more robust about the study of human populations um, and stuff like that. So uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, a brilliant radical geographer gives this uh, very helpful and effective definition of racism. She says, quote, racism is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. That's a, it's a mouthful and I think it's worth reflecting on and lingering on kind of each of those terms to see what exactly Ruth Wilson Gilmore is saying here. Uh, and maybe I'll start with a quote, uh, take it backwards. Uh, so vulnerability to premature death is, is one of the factors uh, that she's using in this definition, vulnerability to premature death, how vulnerable a person or a population is to, to premature unnatural causes death. Right. Um, and she says racism is constituted by the production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Okay, so group differentiated, meaning like how different populations have different vulnerabilities to premature death. Uh, poor and working class folks have a higher vulnerability to premature death. Black folks and Black communities have higher vulnerability to premature death, uh, and so forth. Not only those populations, but examples. So that's what she means by group differentiated, different groups. Um, production and exploitation of that group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, uh, meaning that this is a state of affairs that is created. It's not natural. It's produced by someone or something. And it's exploited. Not only is it passively produced by social structures, uh, it is also exploited for the benefit or profit of some groups uh, over and against others. Production and exploitation. Finally, uh, working our way back to the beginning of the quote, she says racism is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, meaning uh, the, the government the state allows this, uh, sometimes participates in the production and exploitation of it, and 
uh, social structures and systems that are outside of the law, not like necessarily meaning like above the law, though sometimes, but like uh, agencies and institutions and organizations that are that are not associated exactly with with government and with the legal system. Uh, banks, homeowner associations, uh, businesses, stuff like that might be considered in this particular way, extra legal. Uh, the private, the, I think the public sphere and the private sphere might be another uh, way of time saying what she's saying. Uh, both of those kinds of structures or institutions participate in producing and exploiting uh, the fact that Black people in Black communities, uh, Latino, Latino, Latinx people in communities uh, are more vulnerable to premature death than white communities. Cool. Uh, so I think that's a, we could have covered that definition in obviously the week we talked about the Black radical tradition. Um, it, that definition, that idea of racism as a system, as a social structure of differentiated power and vulnerability uh, obviously permeates all of the hip hop that we're studying. Not every single song exactly explicitly, but it is the backdrop for this entire culture, this entire art form, right? And the lives and livelihoods of the people and communities who create and maintain this culture thing that we're talking about and studying in this class is in the shadow of and wrestling with the shadow of racism, not just as an individual holding a belief that one race is superior to another, but racism as this systemic, socially produced state of affairs where uh, some groups are more vulnerable to premature death than others, and that that is a fact that is produced and maintained by and exploited, capitalized on by certain populations. I think Ruth Wilson Gilmore is also a prison abolitionist. Uh, I haven't read much of her work, but I, I think she uh, talks about the what, what I, I gave a kind of description of in a previous lecture video, the carceral state and the logic of incarceration. Uh, and so for her, prisons, the prison system and the legal system is one of those ways in which racism is, is produced and exploited. The school to prison pipeline, the prison industrial complex, the fact that prisons are actually making profit off of the labor of the people in prisons, who we know are, you know, a, a huge percentage of them are black and brown folks arrested for nonviolent crimes, stuff that's now legal. People are still in prison for uh, having weed. Um, and we can go to the, the dispensary down the block and uh, by gummy bears and whatnot. So messed up. Okay, so <laughs> violence, death, and elegy, a very uplifting uh, topic. Just sprinkle uh, some scholarly definitions of racism in there, uh, just to spice it up a little bit. Cool. Cool, so let's get into the songs for this week. First up, we've got Ice-T, Colors, 1988. Uh, Y'all probably know Ice-T from Law & Order Special Victims Unit, uh, which is hilarious that his career is like playing police officer. Um, and he started out, he, he, in addition to the song that we're studying here, uh, one of his major hits was with a, a metal band that he created called Body Count, and the song was called Cop Killer. Uh, so it's one of those things where like, how did his career shape out the way that it did? Um, but Ice-T, Colors, he was one of the, he was one of the early gangster rappers. And, and to me, I think he's one of the, his, his lyrics are, are some of the most intelligent analyses of gangster culture of like why and how the lionization, well, like kind of celebration or holding up as heroes of gangster culture happens, why and how that happens and where it comes from. And he doesn't do it 
you know, as like an outside critic who is critiquing it or a scholar who's analyzing it. He's like talking about his lived experience, the lived experience of his friends and community members. And he still has this kind of like in-depth analysis of like why and how this happened. So, so I think Colors is a fascinating song where he's both celebrating and condemning gang violence at the same time. He's saying, we know where this comes from. We know it comes from this, you know, this system of racism as Ruth Wilson Gilmore defined of like all kinds of different structures and dynamics leading to like a really shitty, violent, oppressive, dangerous atmosphere that Black people live in, Black communities uh, exist within. And yet he still like participates in it. He doesn't feel that he has a choice. So really interesting song. I'll also say it, it comes from his lived experience, but he also was never an official gang member as far as I understand, as far as his like biography is concerned. Uh, he knew gang members. He was sort of associated to some extent, but he never was fully uh, inducted. And so this song, I would say, speaks in persona. And that's one of our one of the literary devices that uh, that we'll talk a little bit about over this second half of the class. And one thing that you might use to analyze uh, this song or other songs, it's the idea of persona. Um, some poets, some rappers, speak in obviously fictionalized voices and we we call those persona poems when they're when they're on the page uh one of my favorite poets patricia smith has a book where she writes in the persona of hurricane katrina uh she's speaking as the hurricane so that's just one example of, of any so one definition of persona in poetry is like a highly fictional character who is speaking there's like shades or gradients of that. Some persona poems, some persona songs uh, are somewhat fictionalized, but not exactly. The character that Ice-T is playing in this song is like mostly himself, but maybe not entirely. And yet he's like consciously and intentionally playing up some dynamics of his personality and playing down other dynamics of his personality. And that's how he creates a, a persona in the song. To some extent, you could say every MC in every song cultivates a persona in how they shape their, their voice and their personality. Uh, but it's kind of more pronounced in some than others, right? Eminem, Nicki Minaj uh, are, are people who like very obviously experiment with their persona, their character. Uh, yeah. So Ice-T, persona, uh, analysis of gangster rap while being really good gangster rap. There's some amazing lines in this song. He says, death is my set, guess my religion. Jeez, ooh, uh, it's a hell of a song. Up next, we've got Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth. They reminisce over you, T-R-O-Y, uh, 1992. There's an absolute classic. Pete Rock is the producer. He's like a legendary, one of the best uh, producers, beat makers in the history of hip hop. CL Smooth is the rapper. Um, this song is an elegy and it doesn't fit this week's theme exactly super well the way pretty much every other song does. It's not a song about violence. Uh, it doesn't really mention death to a great degree. And at the same time, it's one of the most famous elegies in hip hop history. Um, it's a beautiful, lighthearted isn't the right word. I don't know how to describe it. You describe it if you read about it. It's a beautiful song. Um, it's an elegy for Trouble T-Roy. He was a dancer with Heavy D and the Boys and he, he died. I think he like fell off the stage or something like that and died. Um, so not like a violent death, not like a not a good death, you know, but it was like an accident. Um, and he was a good friend of, of P-Rock and C.L. Smooth and a lot of people in hip hop culture. And so they decided to make this song for him. Pete Rock is, you know, he did an interview where he talked about the making of this song. And he said, you know, he, he heard this sample that like made him think of T-Roy. And uh, 
and it like he put together the beat and him and some other people were listening as he created it and he said like he broke down crying because it was like he knew that he was making this beautiful thing for his his loved fallen friend uh and then cl smooth comes on and for the most part doesn't talk about t roy he mentions him in the third verse but other than that he's like talking about his dad his grandpa his mom his his family life and stuff like like his own cl smooth is talking about cl smooth's own childhood and family life and stuff but it's a song about reminiscence and so i think that's an interesting thing that it's an elegy for this dude it doesn't really talk about the dude that much but it's all about reminiscing about life and that being a way of making a tribute to uh, a lost friend up next, we've got Tupac, me and my girlfriend. Um, I just remembered another thing that I was gonna say. I'll say it later. Tupac, me and my girlfriend. Uh, Y'all probably know a little bit about Tupac. He's one of those dudes who gets mentioned in the conversation for greatest of all time for a variety of reasons. I am not as compelled by that claim as uh, as some people are <laughs> uh but i you know i grew up in the middle of the country and i grew up listening to east coast rap so i know tupac means a certain thing to to the west coast that he doesn't exactly mean uh to other folks but i think that's like another situation of a persona of that he he cultivated a personality a character a persona uh where like he was the voice of a specific community and he made major contributions to that community so I needed to get him on the syllabus a couple times. Uh, this is a, a great song, though it's like also hard to listen to. It's violent, it's graphic. I don't wanna say too much about it, uh, but I will say that it, uh, I'll give you another literary device term. It, it uses an extended metaphor. Uh, so that might be a thing to think about, look up and reflect on how that's working in this song. Up next, we've got the Notorious B.I.G. Uh, warning. We studied Biggie already once. I think he's a good candidate for the greatest rapper of all time. Just the, the way he uses words, the way he flips up his rhythms, the way he constructs bizarre rhyme schemes uh, is fantastic. But here we've also got narrative and a lot of use of, of imagery. It's a really violent song. Uh, and somehow it's like fun in its violence. And I that's like one thing that I, I constantly wrestle with and wonder about in hip hop is like, how can I, how can, why do I enjoy when Biggie says, you know, whatever, C4, C4 to your door, no beef, no more. Uh, it's been a week since I, I reviewed this song, something like that. Uh, why is that fun? Why is it fun? He talks about having Rottweilers that he feeds gunpowder. That's, <laughs> uh, and there's something about the stylization of it um, that I think we need to be uncomfortable with and we need to ask like why and how did this come to be that we like listen to hyper violent songs and at least a significant percentage of the population who listens to this song enjoys it and thinks the violence is cool what is that about um and i'll give you another literary device term that i think biggie uses really well in this song uh metonymy uh one instance of metonymy is a metonym and that's where you use a, you use an image that is associated with a thing to represent that thing. So Biggie says, there's going to be a lot of slow singing and flower bringing if my burglar alarm starts ringing. Uh, slow singing and flower bringing is a, is a metonym, it's metonymy, that uses those images uh, as a substitute or stand-in for like, funeral or awake. Those are things that happen at a funeral. He, but there's something so much more stylistic and so much more like threatening uh, to say, if you rob me, there's going to be a lot of slow singing and flower bringing, like more threatening and more stylized than saying like, I'm going to kill you and you're going to have a funeral. It's like, that's what he's saying. And yet the, the literary device adds a different element of tone, of style, of threat, et cetera, to it. So metonymy. Up next, we've got Jean Grey, My Story from 2008. Jean Grey, 
uh, for a while, her name came up a lot as like potentially the greatest woman rapper of all time. She was always kind of underground. Um, she never really made it big in the way that, you know, uh, some of the other women MCs that we've studied and are studying in this class did. Um, but her name has always been floated as, as one of the best. She, her, her wordplay, her rhyme schemes, her narratives uh, are just excellent. She's an excellent writer, excellent technical skills on the mic. This song I think is beautiful. It's tragic, it's heartbreaking. It's really hard to listen to. Uh, I'll give you like a content warning in case you haven't listened to it yet. It's about all of these songs are like, you know, deserve content warnings. The topic of the week is violence, death and elegy. The song is about abortion uh, and it also has extended imagery and discussion of, of suicidal uh, ideation and uh, attempted suicide as well. Up next, we've got Kendrick Lamar, Mad City uh, from his 2012 album, Good Kid, Mad City. I think y'all know about Kendrick Lamar. He's the probably the most likely uh, rapper to be thought of as the, the greatest currently doing it, the greatest, the greatest currently living and active rapper. He has positioned himself to be both an artistic visionary, breaking the bounds and molds of what rap can sound like and do, and as a kind of like true school uh, doing the exact essence of what hip hop is. So he's somehow like both an avant-garde artist and like a real authentic dude who raps the way that LA rappers, Compton rappers rap, right? Um, I could have put any song from Good Kid, Mad City on this week, basically. We're gonna study another one uh, in a couple weeks or next, I forget which week. Um, this is a good one. Um, once again, it's a song that contains a lot of violent imagery, a lot of stylized violence. Not as celebratory as some of the other violent songs we're studying this week. Um, it includes the kind of critique that Ice-T includes in his song, uh, but coming from Kendrick's own experience and, and worldview. And up finally, oh, so this is what I wanted to say earlier. I switched up the schedule a little bit. I switched up like the, the songs. If you had downloaded a previous version of the syllabus, I've uploaded or I am uploading uh, an updated syllabus for the last half of class. I've been doing my own, my own studying and trying to expand. My, my knowledge of hip hop is really like about the old school and golden age eras and the underground versus mainstream era. So like the 80s, 90s and 2000s. My knowledge really drops off like 2014 or 2015. And, I, and I've tried to, to balance that out with some new stuff across the syllabus, but I've continued my own studies and I found out some, about some stuff that I'm really excited to share with you and to hear your take on. And Dua Saleh is one of those artists, artists from St. Paul, Minnesota, my hometown. I uh, wonder how many times I can say that in lecture videos this quarter, a lot. Um, they, they use they, them pronouns. Uh, they are an artist I don't know a ton about, but I listened to their catalog over the past few weeks and I'm super impressed. Uh, this song, Bodycast 2020, they released, uh, they said explicitly it was a, a song about police violence and police murders, uh, especially following, I think, the, the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis. Um, and they released it as a, as a fundraiser for some organizations uh, working on uh, that issue. And as you'll hear, it begins and ends with uh, some kind of sample or script or dialogue. I'm not sure where it's from exactly. Uh, that it is kind of clearly about police disrespecting people's rights. Um, but then the, the song itself, the lyrics are pretty abstract. And so one thing I wanted to mention about Dua Sale is I, as far as I understand their work so far, I would say that they are uh, working in, in a, a subgenre that some people call abstract rap. Um, this is not a super widely used term, um, but uh, hip hop heads talk about abstract rap uh, sometimes to, to denote 
lyrics that rely on fragmented imagery or uh, lines, phrases, images that don't exactly add up the, to a clear meaning, um, but instead they create kind of an atmosphere, a mood, uh, a feel, a vibe. And so uh, pause the news from De La Soul. We'll get into De La Soul, I think next week, uh, one of the next two weeks. Uh, Paz Denise, one of the rappers from De La Soul, is, is often considered one of like the, the greatest uh, abstract rappers of all time, and his contributions uh, to, to that art form opened up what, what rap can do overall. And I would say Dua Sale is working in that tradition. Uh, so this song and their other work might not tell a very clear narrative, might not make a very clear argument, and yet they're working with sound, with image, with reference, with rhythm, to create a, a mood or an atmosphere. So this song is, is about police violence, even if it's hard to locate more than a couple lines or a few lines that are very explicitly about that. Cool. Up on the B sides, I'll try to get through quickly. We've got Bone Thugs in Harmony, The Crossroads, a classic elegy, probably a lot of you have heard it before, needs to be on this syllabus. Uh, and yet there's just so many wonderful songs this week that uh, I didn't fit it into the required songs. Atmosphere, WND. If y'all liked Atmosphere in previous weeks, I wanted to get another one out there. WND stands for Writers Never Die. I think this is kind of like a meta uh, hip hop song. It's a song about hip hop culture and its uses of violence in, in kind of a funny way. One thing to know if you decide to listen to this song is that the rapper's the rapper Slug is rapping this song, uh, and his his government name is Sean, uh, and so this is a story about Sean and Slug fighting, and I don't know, I, I've never like heard him say or seen an interview where he said this is a song about himself fighting himself or anything like that, maybe it's just about another dude named Sean, and yet I think there's some kind of like, there's something going on there, he might, it might be kind of an allegorical thing. Up next, Outcast, Return of the G, Return of the Gangster. Uh, yet again, I think Andre just has a mind-blowing verse. What he does with the rhyme scheme is very different in this song. His verse is incredible, and it's a, a response to, uh, to a lot of things, to people thinking that Outcast was too weird or that they fell off because they, they kind of ventured into different more artistic territory. It's a response to violence in hip-hop culture, et cetera. Blue and Exile, I don't think we've had them on the syllabus yet. Um, their 2007 album, Below the Heavens, is an absolute classic in the underground community. Blue is the rapper, Exile is the DJ and producer. Um, it's just awesome. They're from LA. I would recommend listening to the whole album. It's one of my favorite albums. Uh, but this, this song in particular, I think, is a beautiful elegy and reflection on violence. Blue is a really good rapper. Uh, he's another dude who, like, he never really lived up to the standard he set in this record. The stuff he made later on didn't quite reach that level, which is a bummer because this is like, it's the highest level of rapping. The Uncluded, uh, Bats 2013. The Uncluded is a, a side project of two artists, Aesop Rock, who's another abstract rapper, uh, beloved in the underground, and Kimya Dawson, she's like a folk singer. And they teamed up to make a very bizarre album. Uh, this song is an elegy for Idea. Rest in peace. Uh, his name is E-Y-E-D-E-A, Idea. We'll study him later in the quarter. He's one of my favorites from my hometown, Minneapolis. Uh, and this song is a weird elegy because Aesop Rock is a very abstract rapper and Kimya Dawson is a folk singer and their stylistic union. Very cool, very weird. Run the Jewels, uh, we talked about early, a great song from there, I think it's their second album. But this is a song about police violence and it's hard to listen to and it's heartbreaking. No Name, we will talk about more in the next two weeks. She's another rapper that I'm digging into her catalog uh, recently and I've been blown away by what I found. I think she's the real deal. I think if she sticks with it, with uh, keeps producing music at this level, 
I would have no qualms with putting her in my in my conversation for the greatest of all time. She makes a few more records at the level she's already made. Uh, bye bye baby. It's from her. I think it's from Telephone. Her first record is that right? Um, we'll hear more about her later. I think she's from Chicago. Dessa, I hope I'm wrong. This was originally on the required songs. It fit strangely. Uh, I think it's a beautiful song and I think what Dessa does with the art form is really interesting and it's clearly an elegy, uh, but it doesn't speak to the, the, the broader issues that most of elegy in hip hop speaks to. Uh, it's not exactly about the culture of violence and racism. Um, well, it's not about that at all. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that I moved it down to the B-sides. I think it's a song worth checking out, but it is not the same kind of example of this week's themes that the other stuff is. Big Silky, I think is maybe how you pronounce it. There's another group I didn't know about. I've known about Psalm One for a long time. She's a good rapper, uh, but I found out about Big Silky in the past couple of weeks, uh, which is a, a, a pairing of Psalm One and this other rapper, Angel Davenport, who I'd never heard of. Uh, this song, Look at God, uh, you have to go to their band camp. I included their uh, the URL here. Uh, this song would have fit really well in the, in the week on the Black radical tradition. This is like a militant response to racism and white supremacy and police violence. Uh, I think it's fun and radical. Uh, and I'm, I hope that you all enjoy it. Finally, for the B-sides, we've got the video. Uh, for Flying Lotus featuring Kendrick Lamar, Never Catch Me. I mean, the song is good, the lyrics are good, but like the video I think is like stunning and gorgeous. I really hope you watch it. Uh, yeah, if you, if you chose to write about that video, I'd be really interested in, in what you have to say about it. I think it's really brilliant. Cool, so the scholarly reading this week, we do not, it's the second week in a row where we're not reading the, the Adam Bradley Book of Rhymes stuff. Uh, instead, I don't think any of his work really does justice to, to this week's themes. So we're reading, this is like my favorite essay of all time. It's a little bit longer. I really hope that you spend the time with it. It makes me cry like every time I read it. It's beautiful, it's heartbreaking. I said that a lot in this week's descriptions. I don't know, I need to like get better adjectives, I guess, I don't know. June Jordan, she was a poet and essayist in the 20th century, black woman. Uh, and this essay is about uh, two things that, that kind of happened in her life at the same time. One, she became, as far as she knows, as far as we know, the first uh, person to teach a college class on black English as a language, as a grammar. Um, so it's about that experience, and it's about uh, racist police violence. One of her students experiences racist police violence uh, during that semester. And so it explores these two narrative threads. Yeah, uh, the beginning, the first few paragraphs especially are like scholarly-ish. They might be difficult to get into talking about the, the cultural linguistics of Black English. But the, the essay kind of uh, evens out after that. It, it settles into a much more narrative storytelling mode. And I, I think you'll, you'll be able to get into it and, and dig it if you get past those first few paragraphs, if you find them difficult. Cool, and finally, the page poems. Uh, once again, I, I think we've got awesome poems up this week. I really hope you spend some time with them. Nate Marshall, uh, he's a great poet, a great person. Um, this poem, Prelude. Uh, I love this poem. I think it's stunning. Is that a different, is that a thing that I haven't said uh, in this lecture yet? It's a great poem. Uh, Patricia Smith. Oh, I mentioned her with the Hurricane Katrina thing. This is, this is not the Hurricane Katrina poems, uh, but Patricia Smith building Nicole's mama. Patricia Smith was a, she was like a multiple time champion in the national poetry slam community. She was a slam poet. Uh, and then she made the jump to, to academia and publishing books and page poems. And she's kind of, she's kind of the first person who made that, that leap in a, in a major way. The first like really successful slam poet to become a really successful page poet. Um, yeah. 
Aziza Barnes, I believe they use they them pronouns. My dad asks, how come black folk can't just write about flowers? Uh, this poem is awesome. Aziza is awesome. Um, another, uh, Aziza, Patricia, and Nate are all, oh, and Kyle, all of these folks are slam poets who made the, the transition to, to publishing and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so Aziza Barnes, great poet, great poem. And Kyle Guante Tran Myrie, uh, who lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> uh, police make the best poets. This thing went a little bit viral on like Instagram and stuff a while back. Um, yeah, uh, a poem reflecting on, on police violence and on the ways that police departments frame uh, their racist violence. Cool, I think that's about all. Um, as always, if you have questions about the material, the concepts, the songs, the assignments, the expectations, et cetera, et cetera, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to make time to chat with you. I'm happy to, to email back and forth with you, whatever works best. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say, I, I should have said this like in the beginning of the video, I'm sorry, because uh, I, I know not all of you make it to the ends of these videos because YouTube tells me, um, how long the average view of these videos is. And yet, uh, I wanna tell you, you know, I know we're getting into the part of the summer where things are getting busier and more difficult. You're probably like gearing up for fall quarter. Some of you are moving to campus or, or whatever else. Uh, so I just wanna say what matters most to me is that you get to dig into the material and you, you get some worthwhile stuff out of what we're studying. And that you take care of yourselves as human beings as best you can in these difficult times. So like, if you're having trouble with an assignment, email me and let me know. If you're having trouble with the deadlines, email me and let me know. Uh, I'm happy to work with you to figure out something that works best for you. I don't wanna punish you all for being busy or for being like stressed and emotionally exhausted or whatever else. Uh, I get it. I'm just here to talk about cool shit with you and, uh, and to help you strengthen your analytical thinking skills in the process. And none of that has to be a super stressful uh, life dismantling thing. So take care of yourselves. Let me know if I can do anything for you. Email me if you need anything. Uh, yeah, I will. You will see me again soon.